moving the needle on founder failure one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Justin Gordon, and welcome to Startup 2.0 by Spark XYZ. Join us each week as we give you access to some of the top investors and entrepreneurs in the country to help you think through and overcome the top challenges that startups face. I, I think there's no better place in the country to be investing than Los Angeles. But working with people in really intense conditions is hard. <laughs> Sometimes when a company is not listening to its customers and just thinks it knows better than its customers, has a really, really hard time finding product market fit. I want to see somebody that that isn't going to stop. You know, this person, you just feel like they're going to they're going to they're going to make it work. Today's guest is Chris Hill, who's an investor in Comcast Ventures, and Chris has a diverse range of experiences, both in consulting and investing, and he brings that variety of experiences in different industries to this interview here. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to have you on here and talk about a variety of things in VC. And where I want to start with is with Comcast Ventures, what areas are you focused on? It's a great question. And the thing that's really interesting about us is most people think that we are exclusively media because mm -hmm. Comcast is our parent company. Sure. <laughs> we do everything. Okay. So we are, we are a generalist venture fund. So our investments are split about 50-50 between enterprise and consumer. And okay. then within those categories, broadly mm -hmm. everything from direct-to-consumer brands, digital media, enterprise soft software, cybersecurity. Uh, we even spend a fair amount of time in frontier technology. This year we invested in a quantum computing company. Jeez. So we will touch just about everything outside of, I would say, medical. Awesome. And what stages are you investing in? What's the average like check size? Curious about that too. Yeah, our, our primary check size is really series A. We okay. will write checks as less than a million dollars in select opportunities and we will write checks bigger than 10. Okay. Uh, but our sweet spot is right now between about three to seven million. Awesome. And then I, one of the last, like, more like logistical questions, just curious about actually the thesis, the investment thesis of the fund. So, so it, our, it was originally predicated on the idea that a lot of things were going on and that Comcast needed <laughs> sure. exposure, you know, this internet thing. We're, one yes. of the things that's unusual about us is we're actually 20 years old. Oh, we're wow. one of the oldest corporate ventures out there. So we started in 1998 when the idea of the internet or, or the idea of venture investing, corporate investing was entirely new. Yeah. Uh, with the idea that investing in opportunities that may be relevant to the company, at least having a pulse on the ground and understanding what's changing in the landscape. So now we don't really we don't serve as opposed to other corporate venture funds as a feeder for acquisition. Uh, there is a whole corporate division that really focuses on those types of investments as okay. well as uh, larger acquisitions like the recent Sky acquisition. What we focus on are really what is changing out in the world. It may or may not be relevant to Comcast, but certainly opportunities that we think are going to have transformative experiences or impacts on the world. Yeah, and with that too, I mean, what does that due diligence process look like for you guys then? So we're very similar to just about any other venture fund. Uh, you know, we want to go in and look at the number. We want to look at the financial numbers. When we are looking at traditionally Series A, we want to have at least some level of product fit, product market fit. Um, you know, do evaluate some of the technology. Uh, one of the things that we'll often do is if we do think that there is a strategic value for Comcast, uh, you know, we'll try to talk to some of our colleagues you know, within the respective divisions, get their feedback as to whether or not they want to partner. So the thing about us is we are a generalist, fin generalist investment fund. Yep. We're looking for returns, not strategic value. But we do look to leverage the parent company to create competitive advantages for our portfolio companies. So we're really looking – so there's things that we can bring to the market as opposed sure. to just – you know, cash, uh, yeah. we'd love to do so. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is because we're so big, there's a lot of things uh, that we can be valuable for. So just going on like the whole thing, yeah, about, yeah, like, yeah, like, like you know, with media, people assume we do just media and we'll do a lot of things in healthcare, um, you know, particularly enterprise software. People are like, why? Yeah. We have 195,000 employees. <laughs> you know, we're a Fortune 50 company. If, right. if we can become a customer of your company, we can be a material difference in sort of performing in sort yeah. of your success of the company. Oh, for sure. And do you find that then companies are specifically coming to you because of that name, that, that partnership potentially? More and more. more, and more. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's been a lot of time getting out there and making people sure that people understand that we are looking at things outside of just traditional media. Yeah. And just going back to that due diligence process a little bit more, I mean, oh, yes. what are some of those things too that also are like maybe red flags or things that kind of, no, that's not, not for us. 
that process. So for us, one of the things we are looking for is how big is the market and ultimately what's the exit? Um, because we are a Series A investor right. that is looking to follow on. Uh, if There are plenty of deals where I like the company, I like the founders, but I don't think that it's going to be a large exit. Uh, it's just, and so if I can't paper or pencil into getting into, say, north of $500 million or, or something or have a need to believe that there's a really large market, uh, I'm just, I can't do that, that those deals. Um, yeah. So we're not, we are not moving the needle for Comcast in terms of revenue, <laughs> but it, you know, we are still trying to make an impact on their, you know, with our financial performance. Yeah. So definitely a little bit larger than others yeah. potentially. And when, what are some of those questions you're asking or things you're trying to find out about the, the founders when you're having those conversations with them through that process as well? So part of it is how clearly can they articulate, articulate their vision? What are they trying to do? Why do they want to do it? Uh, being a founder is really hard. There are going to be as many good days as there are bad days. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they'll tell you it was a lot of bad days, and and the ability, the wanting to stick with it, and you know, push through all of those challenges going forward on a regular basis. So really ha ha understanding why someone wants to do something. Yeah. Uh, depending on the certain area, do they actually have the right background and expertise? Uh, a lot of times. You know, we'll see where someone is interested in an area because of a particular passion, but their skill set doesn't necessarily mean that they are a good fit for that. Uh, and so, well, that's not a red flag. We have a hard time believing that they're going to be successful relative yeah. to somebody who you know has more experience in that particular sector. Yeah. And are there any particular portfolio companies that stand out and reasons why they've been successful? Fortunately, I think we've got a, a number that have been pretty successful, yeah. but uh, <laughs> many to choose from. Many, then, many to choose from. Um, you know, I think one of the ones that was, I think, the really excited about, um, probably because it was sort of a recent exit, was Cheddar, um, at Cheddar TV. And one of the reasons it was successful was because of the founder. John Steinberg yeah. is phenomenal uh, and really has a vision and, and uh, you know, his ability to, to make things happen. Um, that was definitely one of those cases where you knew you were betting on, on him as part of the deal. Uh, yeah. and, and working with him and his belief and, and what he could build was really important there. Yeah, and with him too, is looking at him directly. Then what, what other things about him make him stand out compared to others, and what aspects of him are like, yeah, this is clearly a guy who's going to make something happen. Part of it is their ability to, uh, you know, it's his ability to command a room. Yeah. Um, you know, and in that space, uh, you know, one of the roles of being a CEO in, in many cases is going out and raising money. Of course. <laughs> um, and uh, there are people where that can get taken too far. But you know, being able to connect and, and go out and uh, speak with investors, provide confidence that you're going to be able to deliver on the promises that you are providing is really important. Yeah. And obviously, there's many companies that have been successful in portfolio, but then also on the other end of it, I mean, what are some reasons that companies ultimately fail? I think in many cases, it's about not finding the right product market fit uh, or having a belief that uh, really timing. Uh, and that timing really can boil down to having the right product, but the market's not ready. Um, trying to trying to do a product where the timing of trying to raise capital is not appropriate, uh, that you're just not able to do so. Um, it, and that is a pretty big difference. I mean, if you look at one of the things that made Facebook successful going back was they weren't the first social network. They certainly weren't the last, but they were also one of the, the ones that was really able to start taking advantage of cheaper infrastructure costs. I mean, when you look way back at Friendster and how much they were spending every day <laughs> on servers, yeah. you couldn't build that business. You couldn't, you know, that business wasn't viable or sustainable technology allowed it to be. And so that was just a timing issue. Yeah. And, and with Comcast Ventures itself, then how are decisions made? Because I was just a fair amount of people there too, with the amount of investments you made, how are those decisions made within like the partners and everyone there? Yeah. So we, we really have, it's, so one of the things is even though we are a corporate venture fund, we, our decisions are made by us. We don't okay. need a division sign off. We don't need someone to support, uh, you know, our decisions. We, we know that we need to be able to move fast in order to compete for, uh, opportunities um, among the other sort of top venture funds. And so it really boils down to our investment team, which is really a, a committee vote. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a different threshold based off of size and, and sort of area. Uh, but we really do tend to look at, we have teams in enterprise, team in, teams in the consumer. So based off the respective uh, area that a company might be, we, we sort of look to those partners, uh, team members to have a, uh, you know, an opinion and sort of supporting that or not. Yeah, and you mentioned the size, and we're looking for a big enough market size for these companies, actually a potential market size. I mean, what other things are you looking for from the companies, from those teams that really make them stand out or really make them be a thing where, like, okay, yes, we're going to definitely invest in them? And what are maybe some of those characteristics or things you see? Part of it is, for example, in the case of a Series A, 
how well do you actually know your numbers? Yeah. Uh, you know, if you are a direct to consumer, if you're an enterprise company and you're a CEO and you're a Series A, you should know every single customer in your sales list. I, I think there was one point I had someone who, who told me, well, my head of sales, you know, I don't, he couldn't <laughs> recite the numbers, couldn't tell me what their weighted, you know, sales pipeline. There was only maybe a hundred companies, you know, a hundred companies that customers. Yeah. That is your job as a CEO in, in a Series A place know your customers because you're still trying to figure it out and and the fact yeah. that he didn't know was a challenge so and then knowing the respective kpis um you know what are the numbers if you are a company if i ask you what your gross margin is yeah i expect you to have an answer yeah uh a lot of times that those the, the answers on that aren't as sharp and as you think about sort of being a series a or series b investor it is about growing a company and taking something that was maybe a you know a, a concept and build an entire framework around it. And so that really does, it ultimately at some point, mean you're having some ability to measure uh, the performance of, of the company. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that though. I'm thinking in my head right away to this podcast called Startup and it's uh, Gimlet Media's founder. And uh -huh. I think it was Chris Saka asking him about the numbers. He's like, I, I, I don't really know. He's like, you're the founder of this company and you exactly. don't know the numbers for your company. It's like, yeah, this person knows. And it's like, you have to know that at yeah. that level. Like you have to know that. And, and looking to the team, which is obviously so important for any startup, what are some of those issues maybe you see that these teams face, uh, even within each other that you obviously can help them solve potentially, but what are some of those issues that you see the team themselves face? Uh, I think usually the one of the first things is hiring too early for a particular position that they don't necessarily need. Sure. Maybe that's hiring, you know, a marketing person when they don't actually know what the product is and so you have someone who's out there trying to make things happen and <laughs> you know introducing more noise into the equation than actual answers uh, so a lot of it is actually just choosing the right people um, similarly uh, you know a mistake made with like an enterprise is you'll bring in I've, I've seen a lot happen where someone will bring in a very uh, seasoned executive and say this is gonna be our head of sales and they're from a Oracle or SRP, you know, a company that has this incredible infrastructure <laughs> where like, hey, I, you know, my CRM systems, I can, I can manage teams. They're really, really good at that. Yeah. But being scrappy and being like, no, you don't have a massive <laughs> expense account. You actually have to build the CRM channel from scratch. They're like, well, I had someone else do that. But that's your job at the startup. And so yeah. it's sometimes matching someone's experience with the expectations of what it means to, to, to work at a startup. Yeah, I mean, what else should these startup founders then know in regards to recruiting or in regards to growing their team? Because that is such an important part of it. Anything else you can think of? Uh, I mean, part of it is, is always be doing it. Uh, I mean, they, I think the, the, the language always when talks about is like a third of your time as a CEO is fundraising, a third, <laughs> time, you know, a third time is, you know, is, is, uh, is people, et cetera. Um, you never know when you're going to need someone. And so always having that pipeline of people ready uh, is, is really important because, uh, you know, for example, one of the things like when we raise is we always ask, hey, what are you going to use this money for? Uh, well, I'm going to use this to hire this product person and these couple of engineers. Do you have those people lined up? We want them to say yes because they're, they're, what they're telling us is we're going to give you money on month one. And yeah. in month two, the hockey stick growth is going to start. Well, I know, based on, you know, and, and, and they kind of know, they just, but you know, <laughs> hopefully they know. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully they, they don't always know. Um, but it's like, look, to get that person, you have to have that person. That person to, to drive that hockey stick growth right. has to be started and they have to be onboarded. So they're not gonna be delivering numbers on day one of their start. Yeah. It's gonna be three to six months down the road. And so if you're looking at, so, so one of the things is if you're like saying, hey, I don't have that lined up, but we're going to plan it on tripling our growth. Well, you've got to realize well, how many more additional people does that actually require? How many more salespeople or how many more engineers to launch those additional products? Yeah. And and so that ends up driving and pushing back your timeline. And, and that, of course, is one of the things that's you know really important. Yeah. And obviously, that's a very important question. How are you going to use this money? <laughs> um, what other questions do you have or some of the typical questions you're asking startups as well? Um, so a lot of it's, you know, sometimes it'll be around the bigger picture. Uh, you know, we'll ask about the competition. Um, I think you know there's there's always going to be some form of competition. You can tell me it's legacy competition. You can tell me it's you know an existential. Co it could be an, it could be an existential issue. It could be a recession. It could be something else. There is always going to be something that is going to be some form of competition. Yeah. Um, so understanding that you've looked at those things and, and sort of say like here's what I'm competing against. Uh, we always want to understand that. Um, so that's also another area where, where founders like, I have no competition. I was say, yeah. You have some competition in some capacity. Maybe it's not a, you know, a apple to apples comparison, but it's, 
it's you have something else and, yeah. and, and understanding what that is is is, is important yeah and it, I have to I have to pry a little bit deeper. Is there anything else? Because the the size is great. The yeah, yeah like obviously the competition as well. Um, and looking at that, anything else? Kind of questions you're asking, just trying to prepare the startups as they're raising funding, potentially see what they're going to face. Yeah. So um, I think the you know we will you know we will spend a little bit of time getting to know their personality. Um, I think one of the things that we look at, I'm going to sort of roundabout answer your, yeah, your question sure. in this. Um, is really understanding like how are they going to handle pressure? Yeah. Um, how are they going to handle disappointment? How are they going to handle? Uh, you know, can we work with this person? Right. Um, you know because we want to be involved. Um, you know we want to be supportive, and we want you know want to know that like when things are good, when those conversations are easy. It's when the conversation it's when things are going wrong that are going to be difficult. It's like can we work with this individual? Um, you know, and it's really not just about us, but you know us as a reflection of their customers their employees, uh, you know, the other investors, et cetera. Like what do we see as this person and how they're going to be able to drive, you know, to success. Yeah. And is that just a matter of like looking at their history and seeing like maybe how they already have before or like, how do you like stress test that and like, will they actually be able to build this? And what, what about it is, like, how do you evaluate that? It's, I would say it's a, a little bit of art and science, sure. you know, like as with ventures, <laughs> course, like there's plenty, it's, you know, there's plenty of numbers in venture and then we just throw them out and say like, okay, it sounds about, <laughs> sounds about right on, yeah, on, on that. Um, you, know, you, have to, yeah, you do have to go with your gut you know, yeah. to, to a certain degree. Um, totally. You know, it, a lot of it is how they handle no. Um, you know, I mean, there have been people that, um, you know, we said, look, you're too early for us. And, you know, the, and we'll have a couple, like one of the conversations I'll say is like, you're too early. And they're like, okay, what are some specific milestones that I could hit, you know, where potentially you'd be reinterested in the future round? And I can, maybe I can give you those answers. Maybe I can, it depends on what the business is. Yeah. But then there are some people who be like, well, you just don't understand the business then. And I'm like, okay, well, that <laughs> probably means we weren't a good fit anyway. Sure. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And then with the some of those companies too, mentioning that exact point, these companies you're, you're looking at, and some you're going to obviously pass on a lot of them. How do you keep that in the pipeline for maybe you'll look at later, or is, how does that work within, within Comcast? So, you know, we have a, a, our own internal CRM system the same yeah. way that most other venture funds do. Uh, you know, and we're touching base with uh, those companies, that, um, you know, probably every couple of months to okay. sort of check in with progress, particularly on companies that we're excited about. Um, it, a lot of, it, it's definitely one of those things where there is a little bit of a cadence with certain companies. I'm put reminders in my calendar and I'm like, these are the people I need to touch base with in yep. November and I'm going to have to, you know, and I'll make phone calls to, to sort of go through that. Um, yeah. Unless, you know, I see some news that prompts me to think that maybe they're, they're being more successful than I, than I realized. Yeah. And just to get a, a little bit of a gauge on how many companies, I mean, how many investments are you making roughly a year? We're making about 10 to 20 new investments a year. Okay. And then how many companies do you think you're looking at? We are look somewhere between 2000 to 2400 companies, uh, 2400 companies. So, about one, <laughs> about <laughs> one, <laughs> yeah, about one percent is what we're going to end up uh, funding. So it's it's a lot. Yeah, and you mentioned the CRM too, and I'm just curious as to like how many you actually are keeping. Is everyone in the CRM? Anyone you've talked to or come through? Or you yeah. just okay, so they're everyone logged in. And, yeah, yeah, awesome. we we use Affinity, which is you know a solution a lot of other companies use. One of the reasons we like it is because it automatically syncs with your email. So. Um, you know, one, one of the valuable parts is we're, you know, we're a big team. Um, yeah. and so leveraging the resources to know like, Hey, did I talk to somebody or like, did someone talked to this company? Oh, Hey, Andrew's talked to that person. I'm going to go ask him what he thought about that. Gotcha. Um, and so having that information, having all that synced between all of us is critical for being able to communicate effectively, both internally, but then also to the market. Yeah. And now we'll take a quick break and hear from our sponsor Brex. A big heartfelt thank you to Brex, who without their support, this show would not be possible. We've seen firsthand the difficulties accessing basic corporate credit without providing a security deposit or personal guarantee early on. As companies grow, managing expenses has become more difficult and time consuming, which is why we've partnered with Brex to offer a corporate credit card that is not personally guaranteed, offers higher credit limits, provides auto reconciliation, and integrates with ERPs using receipt capture. Brex is the credit card of the startup ecosystem, and we highly encourage you to check them out. And back to the show. So what areas of the kind of startup landscape are you most excited about right now? Uh, so I, there, there are a couple right now. I think the, the first is what sort of we broadly defined as no or, or low code. Um, and this is, these are areas where the ability to build out software yeah. uh, or, or software-like solutions is getting easier and easier. Uh, what that means is one, more people can use it. Um, 
we think about it in the fact that everyone that's used every single day, we all use our iPhones. But uh, if you look at how uh, how difficult it was to actually make an iPhone app <laughs> 10 years ago versus yeah. now, uh, it really has evolved incredibly. And that's going to get pushed out to other areas of space, productivity tools. Um, I think combining with that one area we're really excited about is and interested in is voice. Uh, you, you can see, I think, Alexa and um, Google are really at the beginning of what potentially is going to end up happening with voice. Voice is actually really difficult. Um, you think about things like search. Search on voice is really difficult yeah. to solve. Uh, you don't have a lot of the context that you necessarily do um, with, uh, you know, with, with writing. Particularly if you say, like, if I say I have to bear with this, is that a bear bear, or am I talking about grinning and bearing it? Like yeah. that's that, you know, that you don't, you know, at least with the spelling, you know what the answer is. True. You can drive searches in a more different way. And you know, think about your search response when you're uh, at Google. Is it your First, second, third, yeah, maybe it's the fifth ones out there. That's actually what I was looking for. But it's on the first page, right? Yeah. Like, and, and that's all you think about. Are you going to listen to you know, Alexa be like, uh, hey, what's the score in the game? No, not that game. No, actually not that game either. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the, the tools are going to get built around that and, and the ability to sort of have the, the advances in sort of NLP and what the ultimate applications of that are, I think, are really interesting. Yeah, and how are you finding those new opportunities, and what are you looking for? How are you actually sourcing that, looking at the potential trends and everything else, too? So uh, it's a combination of referrals. Uh, you know, one of the things is, for, you know, as a Series A investors, we, you know, we often are, are referenced by angel investors, sure. uh, early stage investors who would like us to take a look at deals. So a lot of it is warm intros from, from those companies. Uh, others is, is founders. Uh, we like to think that a you know founders like working with us and, and if a portfolio or someone who who knows us says you should go take a look at this that company um we take those pretty seriously and and, and usually um you know that's a lot earlier on in the process and so yeah. it's an opportunity to you know to see a company sooner and then also it is just cold outreach and market analysis you know what are some of these trends that we're we're looking at and then finding all the all the players in that space and sort of select you know sort of going through them systematically to really understand. Um, and so that, those parts is just like <laughs> being in the library. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, that in one of my classes at USC too, one of the, uh, a lot of investors come through the class that I'm in, one, they mentioned like, yeah, he's literally, he'll he'll look and see something in an article or whatever and just reach out to the CEO. Yep. Like, are you raising? Or like, what's the problem? And he'll just yeah. cold email yeah. if you find something interesting. Which, yeah, and I've and I've done that, yeah. I've, I've done that as well. I you know, saw there was someone speaking at a conference and I thought they were, were Actually, they weren't speaking in the conference, but it was someone who was referenced three or four times by different people. I'm like, okay, she's clearly an expert in the field. Like, I right. need to know what she's looking at right yeah. now. What is she doing? Yeah, yeah, I want to talk to him. And how do, how do you see the like the venture world itself kind of evolving in the near future? I, I think it's going to be, we're at a point where there, I think are going to be some changes within the industry. Uh, one, you're going to see some some macroeconomic impacts. Uh, we're very tail. We're at the going eight, <laughs> nine years on a you know on our on our uh, growth cycle, which is phenomenal. There's been a tremendous mm-hmm. amount of success. Uh, and that's and a ton of money that's been poured into venture as a result of that. Yeah. Uh, I think that there is going to be a correction in terms of the amount of capital that is going to be, going to be going out there. And then ultimately, I think the other thing is really starting to people are going to start thinking like. What is the exit path for these companies? Because it's clearly no longer IPO um, as much as it used to be. Yeah. And the horizons have, tr- have changed so significantly. Uh, you know, if you are a seed investor and you you know you have to be planning on investing for ten years now. Um, you know, that's if if you know for a really successful exit. Uh, you know, when when was Airbnb started? When was Uber started? When was you know these are all companies that are you know eight, nine, ten, eleven years old. Yeah, and with that too, I mean, knowing that and seeing that, I mean, how do you, as a funder, how, how do you, how does that change what you do, or how does that change how, what you look at in terms of companies then? So one of the things that I, we don't leverage this a ton because we still are, you know, looking at our ability to, uh, to we want to see our results and stuff like right. that. But but we most funds have, have a captive term, right? You know, and you go out and you raise and you, you have to invest during a certain period of time, and then you have a couple of years to to look to uh, for the, those uh, deals to be recognized. Yeah. We do have the luxury of because we are investing on behalf of Comcast, we don't necessarily look at it from the same time frame. Yeah. If we need to, if we need to sit on something for a little bit longer, and we want to, we have that flexibility. Uh, and so that gives it, that's a nice thing that we have that that I think gives us some unique ways to look at it. But at the end of the day, 
we are being driven, you know, that we are also looking like what are the expectations within the market? Yeah. Who else are our, what are our other investors looking to do? And, you know, there is a need to be uh, consistent with mar- with the market in order to be able to get into the best deals. Yeah, and you, you mentioned a little bit different with Comcast. I mean, what other, are there any other like, glaring differences or differences between Comcast Ventures and like a typical maybe VC fund then? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first thing is we actually have all these resources. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone in our team talks to somebody at Comcast or NBC or Sky right. a couple times a week. Uh, we know we know what those you know the, those uh, divisions are up to. They share with us. We can use those for vetting for due diligence. Um, you know, we can use those as customers. Um, we we really rely on on sort of having those conversations to help us understand what does a Fortune 50 company really look for right now. <laughs> Um, and so, and so it, I think that's one of the, the big differences for us is we actually have this huge resource behind us that, that um, we really can leverage. Um, and, and, we'll, and then we'll find ways to, to take advantage of that from behalf of the both portfolio companies. Yeah. And looking at the, the startups themselves, then, I mean, what should they be asking of venture firms when they're, when they're raising funds? So I think, what you, one, what is their investment thesis? Why are they investing? What are they looking for? Um, you know, what is their, you know, what has it experienced with uh, founders been that has been both good and bad? Uh, you know, I think one of the things is they should just ask a direct question. Who are some people, you know, <laughs> is, it, they, they, is who's a reference in your portfolio that I can speak to? Right. Um, you know, we want people to speak to our CEOs. You know, we, we think that we're a good investor and that we're, that people like having us and that, that people should be comfortable for that. Um, and, you know, but. Another CEO needs to tell you, you know, what their what their unvarnished opinion is. Yeah, and is there anything else that they, I mean, that would help them decide if like a venture firm is maybe not for them, like specifically? Yeah. So part of it, uh, when taking money from from venture, you have a existential boss. Yeah. You know, you you are responsible to someone, and you are also responsible to a timeline that may not necessarily be yours. Right. Uh, you also are going to be um, have some fiduciary responsibilities in a way that you may not. Uh, may not be necessary for someone if you're 100% private. Um, if, if, if you own the entire company and you want that, that, that jet that just came on the market from WeWork, no one's going to tell you no. Yeah. Um, you know, some, you know, there's usually is someone who's going to say no, you know, when you're making major expenses like that, you know, so if you want that and if you really are independent and you just know, I'm never going to listen to anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely one of those cases where that's probably next. And the other thing is, is it a venture backable business? True. There's, you know, everyone assumes right now, or I think there's a perception in our world that like you need venture to start a business. Most businesses are not started with any venture money. Maybe some seed capital, but you know, it's like you'll talk to companies like, well, we got to twenty million dollars revenue, with, you know, bootstrapping. It's like, well, how did that work? Like, well, that's that's how it usually works. Is like, yeah. you know, you hustle and you you save and you do all those things. There are cases where. Venture is appropriate for incredibly big, challenging problems. The SpaceX, the you know, the or, or massive, massive markets that or you know, like you're had to put, pump a ton of money in. But right. is it appropriate for everything? No, it's not. Right. Um, and and so that's always a real question: is is this a venture you know business? Yeah, and there's like there's there are other sources of funds besides venture. There's other sources of funds, and they can be much more appropriate for you know what someone's you know someone's looking to do. And, and then like I said, it, and then ultimately, a VC is looking for an exit. You know, we we need to get our money back. You know, it's yeah. it's you know we we are we have to sell in some capacity at some point to get our money back to redeploy uh, and return and provide a return to our LPs. Uh, so again, if, if you if you're passionate about what you're doing and <laughs> like I said, you just want to be independent, there's no reason not to do that. I, you know, I think there's there's this term that people will be like, oh, that's a it's not venture backable. It's a lifestyle business. I'm like. That's a business that's doing 10 million top, 50 million, 50 million top line, 10 million EBITDA. Sounds like a pretty good lifestyle right. business to me. That's uh, not and, and, and for some reason, people will think, well, that's not good enough. Yeah. I'll take that all day long. Yeah, I mean, to that point, though, too, I mean, do you ever see that perception changing or that evolving? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think, you know, there, there are many, many good things that venture can provide. Sure. Um, I think there are also things you look at, again, the situations um, that can be really unfortunate with, uh, you know, when, when startups, you know, fail and, you know, a lot of the employees are left um, empty handed. That's true. Yeah. And the CEO, you know, and, and the CEOs, uh, you know, end up doing OK. Um, you know, I think that those those situations will and you know will continue to happen and you know it's really important to i think from a worker per, you know from, from an employee perspective to recognize like look you're putting in a lot of time 
you should be rewarded for that, but it's very different. You know, like the chances of get making that Facebook, like I was a receptionist <laughs> cook and I'm worth two hundred million. Right. It really, is not like that. That that that's unlikely to happen. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I and mean, with those differences too, I mean, with between like a lifestyle business versus a venture backable, obviously not, not every like a small portion are going to be venture backable businesses. I mean, what are some things that people should be asking themselves or thinking about before they decide to even like raise money? Obviously, the size of the market itself. What else could they be thinking about? Uh, I think you know how committed they are to the deal. You know, the, the other thing with with venture or any sort of investment is again, there's a time frame. Yeah. That's so right. if you are not a hundred and ten percent committed. And, and look, any founder is. Sure. Uh, if you're starting a business, you know, it doesn't matter. You are, there's, there's no one who's opening a bakery who's not 110% <laughs> yeah. because they're in there at four o'clock in the morning and staying at midnight in right. a lot of cases. So, but if, if you're not, you know, you don't have as much luxury of time. Like, yeah. you, you know, you are, you are typically on a business that is losing cash every single month and you are on a road to either finding, providing, creating enough value to get additional cash, either through customers or through additional venture, you know, VC. So you can't take a couple months off. Yeah. And if you want that time, I mean, you know, burnout and stress for founders is real, uh, you know, and it is a, it's a, it's a meaningful issue yeah. in terms of the expectations that they have to carry knowing that, um, what's being told of them. Yeah. And kind of to that point too, I mean, looking at the different companies in your portfolio and that, yes, yeah, stress and burnout is a real thing for these companies. I mean, how are you, how do you help them through that? The companies in your portfolio, how do you, like resources you send them to, like, how do you help them through that mental side of it as the founders? Because that is so challenging. Yeah. I, th I think the most important thing is being someone, being accessible. Yeah. Um, you know, we, as I sort of mentioned earlier, being a phone, having that phone call when you're beating your quarter over quarter numbers, that's great. I always love those <laughs> easy. calls. Those are easy calls. Those are the easy calls. Talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the calls where, uh, you know, you're being sued, uh, you know, your biggest customer just dropped you. Yeah. Uh, those are, again, all issues that can and will happen. Uh, if you're not comfortable calling us, uh, one, you are creating more stress. Sure. Uh, but two, I can't help. Um, you know, I can't leverage my resources. I can't leverage my network. I can't do anything to, you know, to sort of help you, you know, go through that process. So part of it is, is literally just trying to be accessible and, and, and there will be tough love. Um, you know, there are going <laughs> to be, there, you know, there are going to be occasions where it's like, look, this isn't, this isn't working. And maybe that is, includes having a tough conversation with a founder about like, they're maybe not the right fit at that time for that company. Yeah. Um, you know, I, and, 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 and so that can be things, but, but a lot of it is also just checking in with them. You know, we do, you know, making sure, putting, making sure that they are talking with other people. Um, you know, as much as it is, you know, 110%, I personally am a believer that you've got to have some outlet. You have to have some balance. Um, perspective is important. And, uh, you know, having, you know, knowing that they're able that they sort of have that, that, that outlet for me is, is critical. Yeah. And with these, I mean, with these founders as well, you're thinking about how they, they know going into it, they should at least know how difficult it is. And yeah. you've heard, you've heard from everyone, like how difficult it is to actually start a company. Um, but knowing that like you, know, you as a resource, for instance, it's that you can help them solve those challenges that are keeping them, keeping them up at night that are they're yeah. struggling with. And that's, that's what at least gives them less stress than yeah, well, to actually and, solve and the problems. Just, and being able to, and you know, being able to, to talk about it yeah. uh, and, and having someone, you know, cause you know, again, if you're a CEO, Particularly, you know, like there, you know, there's a lot of studies that will talk about like a you know single founder versus co-founders. Right. Like one of the reasons that co-founders often are you know it's said to do better is because you actually have someone to talk to these issues about. Exactly. Uh, you have someone to relieve that. If you, in the absence of that, um, you know, you maybe you have a spouse or partner, uh, but and hopefully that person is incredibly supportive. But again, like, how much of your work and stress do you want to you know bring home? Uh, you know, there's a certain point where you, you <laughs> yeah. probably, you don't want to always be able to do that. Right. And, um, you know, and, and then also, you, you know, you've got to be putting up a good face and, and supportive with your company. And so having someone who objectively understands what you're going through as a founder and, you know, how to get through it and, and is, is, is really valuable. Um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons like, you know, when you see founders who like, why do founders like to hang out with each other? It's because they've yeah. all been through the same things together. So they know the experiences and, and, and are that you know and are able to figure out how to solve those problems yeah and for you chris how is your time spent day to day week to week now uh, it varies considerably uh, -huh. uh so i would say about half of my time is looking at new companies um, okay. that may be actually meeting with companies that may be reviewing um you know reviewing some of the due diligence materials that they've 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 sent um potentially doing research on the market 
Uh, about a quarter for me is spent on port existing portfolio. Um, some of my colleagues spend well more, you know, you know, some of my colleagues who've been there, you know, over 10 years. Wow. You know, they've, they've got a huge group of portfolio companies and they're spending probably more, well more than half their time yeah. you know, with all those companies. Uh, and then um, time thinking and just sort of research, uh, you know, trying to, you know, sort of look at what the trends are, not getting caught up in the, in the data. There's always another <laughs> deal to look at. Uh, and, and so try not to get caught up in that uh, exhaustively. Yeah, I mean, because there's always another deal to look at, do you literally just like block out that time for kind of thinking more big picture or how does that work for you? I have to. Yeah. Uh, I'm not very good at blocking it out because there's always something else it has to do. Yeah. Um, oh, this. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So, uh, but yeah, I, I end up having to block out that time. Yeah, just to make sure it actually happens. And then for you, I mean, why did you get into venture in the first place? I've always been in, in investing in some capacity over the last 20 years. And I was one of those people that really loved technology as, as, as a kid. And, you know, I was one of the first people in terms of like, I was not one of the first, first people, but I was building my own computer and, yeah. you know, doing all those kind of things. And I just love the variety of what my job entails. Um, you know, one of the, for both better or for worse, I get to look at a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, and so seeing what other people who are way smarter than me are, are thinking up um, is really exciting. And so just getting to spend time with people like that day in, day out is um, really enjoyable. Yeah. And one thing I heard from a different investor, and it's interesting to talk about this, but like because you could always, in theory, be reading more news and doing more research on it, how do you decide like when to stop each day or when's enough? Or like when you're going to, like, how do you actually make that, that call? I think part of it is distinguishing between when am I actually doing research for the sake of actually doing something for an active investment thesis yeah, and something where I'm like, I'm reading for the purposes of just enjoying, whether it's news or, you know, an, or, or a magazine or, or what have you. Some of those things may end up leading to an investment, but I don't look at that. I, like every time I pick up a magazine, I'm not reading it and saying like, where is the opportunity? Yeah, here? the next thing. Yeah. Um, so I think part of so for me, part of it is actually sort of just not looking through that lens a hundred percent of the time. It's it's actually you know saying like what else is going on because the reality is, uh, you know, if in order for a company to be successful, you're building a product likely in many cases for tens of millions of people. Yeah, those people are not doing what I'm doing. So it's like <laughs> how are they? You know, it's like you you, know, you kind of got to you have to remember like how everyone else is out there. Um, you know, particularly when you're if you're if you're building in New York or San Francisco or L.A. You know, these are not the same. Uh, you know, that, that's not your entire market. You can build companies off of those entire markets. Sure. And many people have, but um, I think that, you know, there are a lot of businesses that, you know, we sort of recognize there's a whole, whole other portions of, uh, of the populace and, and opportunities that, that exist that well outside those immediate ecosystems. Yeah, and how do you suggest that those companies do that research and figure out, like, what the, the other people besides, besides LA, SF, New York, how do you suggest they even, like, do that then? Um, Travel is always a good thing. Travel <laughs> does broaden minds. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think also being um, being intellectually honest with who your sounding board is. Yeah. Um, you know, is every person that is every person that you are looking for for feedback, is it a startup founder? Um, you know, is it a startup founder in a particular city? <laughs> um, you can talk to them about like those are there are great questions about industry or 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 you know, how to deal with a particular business problem, but are you talking to people, you know, but, but if everyone looks the same, you're not getting that diversity of thought or opinion, right. that is gonna be critical for understanding the broader picture. Yeah, and with your experience the last and the number of years in investing, I mean, is there anything else that you would mention to founders, anything helpful for them as they go through building their companies, fundraising, anything at all? I think part of it is being, um, I think it's a little sense of groundedness is is always is is always uh, important. Um, having you know being able to maintain perspective when things are totally crazy and they will get crazy and, and like I said, look, you have to have a singular point of view to actually make these things happen and like you have to have that absolute you know drive. Um, you're going to as an investor, you, as a founder, you're going to talk to seventy five or a hundred people that are going to say no. Yeah. Um, you know. For your, you know, just to get your money, and then you're like, great, I got my money. Then you have to, you have to talk to a hundred people who are going to say no is your first customer. So I think more than anything else is separating that it is just, you know, what what is deeply personal to you as a founder that you may have the view is not necessarily to somebody else. True. Uh, it, it is unfortunately sometimes it is just business or it's just not interesting, and that is not a reflection on you, uh, you know, in any capacity. 
and so keeping that in mind um, is, I think, really important because you are always pushing a rock uphill. Yeah, and, and one thing too is one of the last things that I'm curious about. So with you or your founders, I guess, I mean, how do you then manage burnout? Because we mentioned burnout as a thing, clearly for startups because they're just manic trying to build their company. But even with you investing all the time, potentially, like how do you manage that, or how do you suggest people could really manage that, like that burnout as they're trying to build a company, spending so much time on that. I think being, I think having some boundaries being set, you know, pretty clear, um, and and respecting those boundaries, um, you know, whether that that's time with family or friends or doing, you know, a hobby. And again, I, I mean, I'm, I realize that people are going to be working ninety, well, hundred hours yeah. stuff, but you, but but you know, having some boundaries where you you do have that decompression, like having some time to sleep and actually enjoy, you know, and enjoying the sleep. I think. Uh, yeah, I, I will admit I am not a big believer in the, or not a big believer, the, the hack yourself, you know, the, the philosophy I'm going to, you know, the, the body hacking. Like I'm polyphasic gonna, sleeping and all this. Yeah, it, look, it, we are designed and built to do things in certain ways. Sure. And, like, you can work around that, but, like, also take advantage of, like, the natural advantages that we have. Uh, and I think being very clear about that and is, is important because it is, again, it is a marathon. It is not a race. Um, you know, it is definitely, so, so you know, Things are going to change. Who you are is going to change. Who your, you know, who, who their company is going to change. And so, having the ability to to grow and mature with that in part means actually having enough time for self reflection. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And with uh, with any company trying to reach out to you, what's the best way them for them to get in touch and also learn more about Comcast Ventures? So the cliche answer is warm intros are always better. Um, you know, so yep. that, that yes, yes. So um, <laughs> and uh, you know, if you say. You don't know, you know, don't know me or, or somebody else. It's like, you know, a, you know, you can find my email on like LinkedIn and, and I will, you know, reach out to me that way. Um, but I do get a lot, as do many investors, I get a yeah. lot through, you know, those cold channels. I try to answer as many as I can. I do not get to all of them uh, in, in a meaningful way, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, having a warm intro, someone who I, trust and respect asking, um, you know, to, to, to listen, to take my time. Like yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be responsible, responsive to that. Yeah. And I mean, it just makes sense. If, if an entrepreneur can't do that, like how resourceful are, are they to get, to find a way to get a warm intro? It is, people have said before on the show, like it is a kind of a sign that like, yeah, what are they doing? <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, look, my job is to meet with people. Yeah. Like I'm not, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm not trying to make it impossible. This is, you know, this isn't, uh, <laughs> You know, like I'm gonna put you in an escape room, and like you know, the, like if you can't get out in 30 minutes, it's not you know, like you yeah. don't get my email. Like it's not that hard, you know. Like it's 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 uh you know it's not that hard. Yeah. Um. You know, but but and also I think the other important thing along that lines is, um, when reaching out to me or to any investor, uh, making sure you've done some research about who we are, what we've done, uh, and understanding what we're interested in, and and why you why you think we might be a good fit. Um. Even if you're wrong, the fact that you've spent that time uh, is is important to me in terms of how you're thinking strategically and critically. Yeah. And Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks very much. Thanks for checking out Startup 2.0 from Spark XYZ. If you want to learn more about startups and investing, you can check us out. Join the ecosystem at sparkxyz.io.